Yeah, actually, starting <coughs> point for this paper was uh, I looked at a very extensive uh, review study which was published in Lancet, I think, two years back. And this study had looked at several published studies. It was a meta-analysis, kind of a meta-analysis. Uh, what interventions work in low and middle income countries for improving safety? And what struck me from this study when I looked at the table and what kind of studies had been evaluated, most of them had to do with either enforcement or education, educating drivers and educating other road users and measuring effectiveness of those interventions. So, so it was the basic focus in those studies was legislation and educational measures to improve road traffic safety problems in low and middle income countries. And from there it struck me that how is it that when we are looking at published literature, we don't find the kind of discussion we've had just earlier that looking at uh, evaluations and evidence of other kind of measures. Have we changed road designs? Have we changed uh, city designs? What kind of standards uh, are we looking at? Hardly any. In this meta summary, out of, if I remember the um, numbers correctly, there were two studies which talked about evaluating impact of speed humps, and one of them was looking at uh, evaluating impact of pavement. So that was the starting point, and that was me <coughs> thinking that does it imply that when we are talking in the context of low and middle income countries, the assumption is that the kind of standards we have today are already correct. So if you are making the roads comply with these standards and we still face a lot of um, traffic safety problems, we have to look at other measures to improve safety. So then I think in the next few slides I'm going to share with you, let us try and understand there are huge differences. There are Scientific principles should always remain the same, but the context changes. And so here you look at what are the conditions prevailing in low and middle income countries. Both pictures here are showing actually major national highways. These are fast intercity roads. These are not rural roads, small rural roads. This is national highway system which used to be two lane divided, it became four lane divided, and now it's becoming six lane divided. And what do you see here? These national highways are passing through towns and villages. And in the paper, I whatever published literature I could found from there, I have uh, written down the extent of these highways which pass through uh, towns and villages. At least between one to 1.5 kilometer of these stretches are passing through small towns and villages in different countries, in low and middle income countries. And as a result of it, these highways are uh, having this both kinds of traffic coexisting. It is meant for fast through traffic, but at the same time you have a lot of local traffic. Local people who are living on both sides of the highway, they need to cross the road. And they need to do, they are in different modes, and they are uh, doing uh, other businesses on the same roads. Again, from the published literature, I found that if you just look at the kind of speed variation that exists on this road, and the first graph is showing you, these are all national highway and state highway sites from India, and you see the <coughs> green line is showing the lower speeds, mm. and the red line is showing the upper speeds. So at least a difference, the lower speeds are in the range of 20 to 15 kilometers per hour, at the same time, there are vehicles on the same highway, same carriageway, where the higher speeds go between uh, anything between 50 to 70 kilometers per hour. So the same huge speed variation existing. And the second one is showing that these are again all highway segments. And you see the presence of the kind of vehicles that we don't expect, uh, at least not in North America and not, not in Western Europe. Uh, presence of motorized two-wheelers, also non-motorized vehicles including bicycles and animals, animal carts. So our uh, highways in a way are carrying not very different traffic that exists in our urban areas. And it is not surprising therefore that some numbers that you saw earlier also 
that proportions of pedestrians and motorized two wheelers in fatal crashes in many of these situations is somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of the total fatalities. And uh, more in other, uh, I think, uh, things that we start observing uh, from our uh, high, how highways are being used is that we design highway shoulders. The standard tells you the shoulder should be 1.5 to 2.5 meters wide. And what is the function of the shoulder? But in the situation that we are dealing with, shoulders are being used by slow moving vehicles. That would include agricultural vehicles like tractors. It could include bicycles, it could include animal carts. As a result of it, shoulder is not really available for other purposes. The original purpose that if there is a breakdown, you have a shoulder. If, uh, if a vehicle runs off the road, skid is, skids off the road, you have a clear shoulder. So as a result of it, the function of shoulder here is completely changed. And since, right, uh, so, if I talk about uh, the curbside lane is being used by, uh, th that means in our situation, left lane is being used by slow moving vehicles. Uh, the heavy vehicles which are required to go on that curbside lane, they are in the right side. And therefore, when people have to overtake, now it's become a norm. You drive on any Indian highways, national highways and state highways, which are divided roads, the norm is to overtake from the passenger side. The driver cannot see the overtaking vehicle. So the question is, is it lack of knowledge? Is it the drivers don't know that they should not be overtaking from this? We need better driver training. We need better enforcement. Or should we start questioning the road design itself? Is it really meeting the requirements of the kind of traffic that exists on this road? If you are allowing mix of traffic, mix of slow and fast vehicles, this kind of behavior should not be a surprise. And if this is leading to unsafe situations, I think then a lot has to do with introspection of what kind of designs are required here. So then in the literature when I started looking at, and since morning we've heard, there is a lot of discussion on scientific method. We should be collecting right data. We should be looking at the scientific method and we evaluate and then see what works and what doesn't work. So it should be evidence-based intervention. But the evidence is generated by the data we collect. And why do we collect data? It is based on our understanding what is working and what is not working. So if our fundamental understanding is that 90% of the time it's driver's fault, we keep collecting data to show, to evaluate interventions which is going to improve driver behavior. So the thing that struck me here is that the so-called scientific method and evidence-based intervention is not independent of the fundamental theory that we have understood. So I had a lot of, I mean, I read several papers published by Rooney Elvig and also Ezra, and both pointing out that behavior, of course, everything is about how people behave on the road. But the road design itself and the vehicle design itself has a lot to do with it. So if a fundamental vision is different, perhaps we start collecting different kinds of data. So if the theoretical understanding is that driver error causes traffic crashes and driver tra training can reduce traffic <coughs> crashes, then we collect different kind of data. However, if the understanding is driving behavior is influenced by road and traffic characteristic, then we collect different kind of data and we produce different kind of uh, evidence. So then in the, I mean, I started, I mean, went into deeper into what has really evolved as safety science and what have we borrowed from safety science to traffic safety. And this one paper that caught my attention was that three cornerstones of evolution of safety science has been interdisciplinarity, problem orientation, and system approach. <coughs> now, since I have only two minutes, I'm not going to elaborate on this. Maybe we I have more questions later than I can elaborate. So from this, I borrow three main principles. T 
to suggest what could be the principles for designing, coming up with new standards, new road design standards for the context that we are talking about. Recognition of human frailty, acceptance of human error, and creation of forgiving environment, and appropriate crash energy management. Now, many, many of you must be familiar with this. This is not a new thought. This is what is embedded in Vision Zero. So principle one and two must recognize that highways and LMICs will have presence of NNPs and pedestrians along with motorized traffic. Principle three becomes operation principle for setting appropriate speed limits for ensuring a forgiving environment for all road users. So we cannot say that we have a national highway, therefore we cannot have a speed limit on certain segment of 30 kilometers per hour. So we'll have to come up with those kind of arguments here. Pedestrians will make mistakes in judging the possible risk in the system, whereas drivers can make mistake in adapting an appropriate speed. So what should we do? The design speed, I think, so I'm just going to focus on speed here. And Krista told you a lot about speed. This is a very, uh, as Krista points out that Everybody knows it's important, but we are not able to do anything about it. So the design speed must be in line with the requirements of principle three. Creation of a forgiving environment and appropriate crash energy. So as traffic engineers, we know that we are using design speed to design horizontal curves, to design vertical curves. What is a design speed? So this is here we start saying, since the highways are going to be used by these different users, the mix of traffic is going to be different. Let us adapt an appropriate design speed accordingly. So the first suggestion is design speed may vary from 30 to 90, depending on how we design the cross section. If we are not able to provide a separate, let us say service road where we can put all our slow moving traffic, we will have to have a lower design speed. And we cannot use the argument that this is a high speed road, it's linking two major uh, cities, it's an intercity road, therefore we must have high design speed. Last, so LMICs have weak institutional capacity, we keep hearing about this in all the documents, weak enforcement legislation, etc., etc. So therefore, if we now want good speed compliance, what strategies do we have? Most effective measure for speed compliance is by design. So we will have to have active speed control measures. So to me, it's this seems to be the lowest hanging fruit. Wide use of speed coming, and we cannot say this is national highway, so we cannot have speed coming measures. This is what the current Indian highway standards say, and we will have to revisit many of these things and change it. So last thing is, so realization of Vision Zero also requires generation of new <coughs> knowledge. Many of the things that I have talked about and earlier people have mentioned IRAP, actually we don't know that if we make wider shoulders, what impact it has on safety in Indian condition. If we make, uh, what happens if you introduce, I'm talking about introducing uh, speed calming measures on national highways, but we don't have good experiments and uh, evidence exactly what is the impact of that. So I think most important thing is continuous experimentation in LMICs to develop safe highways based on principles of safe systems approach. So more experimentation, only that leads us to new knowledge and only then we can come up with meeting any targets, if at all we want to set it in future. Thank you.